Pearl was a 90-year-old great-grandmother who was rather overwhelmed with the prospect of buying gifts for five children, 18 grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren, not to mention her close friends. And so she decided she would make life easy on herself this Christmas and give them all a gift, but, but she'd write them a check. So she sat down with a steaming cup of hot cocoa, her cat, Janie, purring on her lap, and she began to write the cards. She wrote a personal note in each one of them, so it took her some time. It took her all one, all, all one entire day. When she was finally done, after she wrote a personal note for each of them, she signed it, Granny Pearl, and then she wrote a P.S. P.S., buy your own present. So she put the cards in envelopes, she put a stamp on all of them, addressed them, sent them off, and she sat back in her chair at her desk and breathed a sigh of relief. All her Christmas gift giving was done. Well, the season came and went like it always does, and it was a flurry of activities and all kinds of family events and gatherings, and it was an incredible time for her. Christmas season was over, and about 20, the 27th, 28th of December, she thought, you know what, it's time to take all the decorations down. She was cleaning up her home, tidying up at this place and that place, and she finally got back to her desk, and, and she saw a stack of Christmas advertisements, and, and as she picked the advertisements up to throw them in the trash can, out dropped a bundle of checks. And it dawned on her that she had written her Christmas cards to all of her loved ones, and at the very end, she said, buy your own present, and did not include a check. I love getting Christmas cards. They're kind of fun. And we have a really cool tradition around here. There'll be a table that'll be set up here shortly out in the foyer. If you'd like to give a Christmas card to people in our congregation, people that you know and see every week, you'll have an opportunity to do that. But when I was thinking about Christmas gifts, it struck me that I was really appreciative that God didn't see our needs and send us a message that was so simple like that because he was, he was too tired, it was too much effort. He didn't say to us, buy your own present, figure it out for yourself. God saw our desperate need for a gift that we could not afford, a present that was way beyond our reach, and he sent his best gift down to us, wrapped perfectly in flesh and bone. Turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. If you're following along with uh, the Pew Bible, the Bible right in front of you, um, then you'll want to turn to page 479. We're beginning a series today that'll go four weeks through Christmas, through Advent. Um, it's going to be on this one passage, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. By the time we're done, you will know this passage and you won't even try to memorize it. It'll be that clear to you what we're doing and why we're doing it. But in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, we, we see the titles that this coming king that Isaiah foretold uh, is given. Um, interesting thing about Isaiah. Isaiah, for the first 39 chapters, it's all about judgment. It's all about all the horrible things that are happening to the people of Israel or will be happening to them because they've rejected God, because they've chosen to go their own way, because they've rejected his wise counsel. Chapter 40 starts, O comfort, comfort my people. And for the rest of the book of Isaiah, all the way through chapter 66, it's about what God is going to do to, to build them up, to encourage them, to receive them back again. It's kind of like the story of our lives. We mess up and we feel like there's no way God would ever want us, that God would reject us and throw us away because we're such horrible people. But he says, no, I welcome you. I want you. You are my creation and I want you to be part of my family. Well, even
even in the midst of God's pronouncing judgment in those first 39 chapters, he gives Israel and he gives us hope. If you were to look at the first eight verses of Isaiah 9, it talks about people in, in a darkness seeing a great light. If you delve into those on your own, you'd see that he's talking about us. He's talking about Gentiles who have no way to come to know God unless he reaches out to us. And so when he talks about this coming king, he wants us to know exactly who he means. He wants us to be able to look for this king and to know what to expect when he comes. Well, we know that he's come. We know that he came in the manger. We know that he lived the perfect life. He, he died, he was buried, he was resurrected. But maybe we don't really often think about who he is. So this first title of this first thing that we learn about this new king is that he is a wonderful counselor. Look at this passage. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This short little passage has so much rich, deep theology in it. We could spend months on it. Well, we will spend a month. He's our wonderful counselor. Now, Isaiah didn't use the word wonderful the way that we do. When we say something is wonderful, we mean that something is good or something is outstanding. If I say I had a wonderful time last night, I mean I had a good time. I enjoyed myself. Maybe another use of this word wonderful is the way that, that we expressed ourselves two Thursdays ago as we wheeled ourselves away from the table after our Thanksgiving meal. And we said, what a wonderful meal that was. Outstanding. It's good. It's outstanding. That's kind of how we think of the word and we would use the word wonderful. But when Isaiah describes the coming king as wonderful, he means something so much more than that, something so much richer than that. The word translated um, wonderful is used in, in uh, excuse me, uh, Psalm chapter 78, verse 12, to refer to the 10 plagues or the 10 miracles that God performed in Egypt when Pharaoh wouldn't let the people of, the, of Israel go. In this short little passage, he says, God did wonders in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt. That's the same word here. And what he's saying is that when, when this applied to Jesus, that Jesus is a worker of miracles. And we know when he came to the earth, he worked incredible miracles. People couldn't understand how he could do it and what was happening. All that was because he is wonderful. He is a worker of miracles. Now, another use of this, this word is found in, in a conversation that happened between Samson's parents and an angel that came to him. Um, the angel of the Lord, we're told, and I believe that that's a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus. So in this conversation, was remember Samson, the guy, the, the big guy, the, the he-man with the she problem? Um, Samson, Samson's parents had this conversation, and in the conversation, they, they just, they want to know what to call the angel. What's your name? We want to know who you are. We want to know what to say to other people when, when they ask us what happened. Or maybe we just want to brag on our son. What's your name? Listen to what he says. This is kind of interesting. He says, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? They asked him for something that even if he gave them, they wouldn't understand it. So the word wonderful is used of something that is beyond human comprehension. So when we say, when, when Isaiah says Jesus is wonderful, he says he is a miracle worker who is beyond your understanding, beyond human grasping. You cannot even come, to clo come close to understanding who he is and what he's about. I think one commentator captured the sense of the, the concept of, of the wonderfulness of Jesus pretty well when he joined with Paul's words, and he said, by the first title, he arouses, this first title, Wonderful Counselor, he arouses the minds of the godly to earnest attention that they may expect from Christ something more excellent 
than anything they have seen in ordinary course of God's works. Something beyond anything we would ever expect for a human being to be able to do. As if he said, and here's where he, he kind of plays a little bit with Colossians chapter 2. He says, in Christ are hidden the invaluable treasures of wonderful things. Anything you could conceive of, Jesus is far more beyond it. Anything you could expect that a human could do, Jesus is more powerful and has more ability to do much more miraculous things than you and I could ever imagine. Genesis 1-1 begins, In the beginning, God created. And that's pretty extraordinary. Pretty wonderful. But even more wonderful than that. John 1-1 one, one says, in the beginning. And John uses those three words to remind us, to make us reflect back to Genesis 1-1, one, one, where, where God said, in the beginning. So in John, in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that has been. All of the language referring back to the creation help us to make that mental connection that Jesus is the very one who spoke everything into, into, into existence in the beginning God created. And in the beginning was the Word. And everything was created by Him. There's nothing that was made that has been made that has not been made by Him. All the imagery correlates back to that creative moment when Jesus carried out that significant act but more significant than even the creation is when he came to carry out God's work of redemption God's work of restoration his work of reconciliation he is wonderful beyond our comprehension miracle work Jesus is not just wonderful. He's not just a doer of marvelous and incredible things beyond human understanding and, and, and abilities. He's a wonderful counselor. A wise person in any position of leadership surrounds himself with a team of counselors. People who, who are well versed in lots of different areas of life. People who can speak truth to them. And you pray that those people in leadership will listen to those around them. However you wanted the election to turn out, it is important that we pray for President-elect Trump. We pray that he will surround himself with good people. We would pray that he'd surround himself with godly people who would be able to speak wisdom into his policies, into his practices, into how he presents himself as around the globe. It's important that we understand that Jesus is not in need of a counselor. He is wonderful counselor. He does not have to surround himself with people. He doesn't, he doesn't rule by, by poll. He knows what is right always and every time. He knows exactly how to, to handle any situation. He knows exactly what we need at every time. Now stop for just a minute. Think about that. Maybe you're in the midst of a time when you're thinking, wait a minute, if he knows what is best for me, I'm kind of wondering who's at the wheel here. You ever been through a tough time and you wondered if God understood? And you wondered if he cared, if he... You wondered if he was in, in charge of things like you think he should be? We're told that Jesus, in him, the spirit of counsel and power, Isaiah eleven twelve 12 says, resides in him. He needs no one to give him counsel. So we kind of come to a collision with our experience in what the scriptures say. And how do we resolve that? Let's let that tangle for a moment. Later on, Isaiah explicitly says that the care
characteristic of being a wise, wonderful counselor is part of God's qualities. It's one of the ways that God the Son and God the Spirit and God the Father are all alike. Isaiah 28, 19 says it this way. 29, excuse me, says it this way. All this comes from the Lord Almighty, wonderful in counsel and magnificent in wisdom. The role of the counselor is to impart wisdom and experience, to lead people from darkness and confusion into light, from danger into safety. That's what Jesus does for us as our wonderful counselor. He brings light into our darkness. He provides guidance and direction. He will always discern and give the wisest counsel. He does not need to surround himself with wise counselors because he always has wise counsel residing in himself and he needs to look nowhere else. Disney tells us that if we want to know how to live life, make good choices, then we need to simply follow our hearts. And for the most part, we have bought that lie. Hook, line, and sinker. How can something so wrong feel so right? If it feels good, just do it. Go for it. Go, lead with your gut. But the scriptures tell us, and this is a hard word, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? follow your heart, but your heart is sick. Who can understand it? Instead of following our hearts, Isaiah would tell us, follow the wonderful counselor. We would be wise instead of listening to our hearts to lead our hearts. The heart at best can be a confirming voice. It should never be our leader. Our wonderful counselor speaking to us through his living word and the spirit who lives inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus will lead us wisely every single time. But our hearts will lead us astray. The heart is not a reliable leader, but it is a wonderful follower when it beats in sync with God's heart when it beats in sync with what God wants us to do. The world does not need a better president. It does not need better politicians. The world needs not a better philosophy of government, a more perfect system of legislation. What the world needs and what you need and what I need is a person who has the character, wisdom, and power needed to rule for God among men. That's what we need. And that is who our wonderful counselor is. The doer of miracles, of marvelous and wonderful things which are beyond human ability and understanding, who never makes a bad decision. So what happens? What am I supposed to do when my experience and this truth collide? Well, I can either follow my heart Maybe I can follow the hearts of someone else and get their advice and counsel. Or I can rest in the truth that Jesus is my wonderful counselor. That he has the wisdom that I need for every situation. That he has everything that I need for life and godliness. Everything that I need to weather the storm that I'm going through. He never promised that we would not go through difficult times. But what he did promise is that whatever you're going through, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be with you. And I always have a purpose and a plan. And I always will take even the most wicked things that the enemy means to destroy you. I will take those things and I will bring good out. I will make you stronger as a result. We need Jesus who always counsels wonderful things. And here's 
the really awesome of God. Our wonderful counselor is always close at hand. His voice is always readily available to any of us when we give him a listening ear. Jesus promised that when he left, he would give them another interesting word, counselor. Now, the word that we'll look at in just a minute in the, in the passage in John, another, is, is a really interesting little word. There's two different words in the Greek that could be used to, to express another. One is heteros, which is another of a different kind. The other one is alos, which is another of the same kind. So when we read this passage, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you another of the same kind, another just like me. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another of the same kind, advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. You've heard the, the, the Greek word paraclete. That's, that's the word here for, for this um, this uh, advocate that's supposed to be with us is one that's called alongside. Another way to translate this word is counselor. Do you think Jesus is telling us something? The counselor that we need is not some far off being who's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The counselor that we need is the Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of every single believer. When you come to the place where you understand that you are a sinner who is separated from God and you understand that Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on your behalf taking your sin and my sin on himself when you put your faith and trust in Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior and only hope of God not only does he forgive you not only does he buy you back and pay for your sin but he gives you an incredible gift. God, the Holy Spirit, comes to live inside of you. He is that other counselor that Jesus promised. And he is with you at all times. So, the obvious question then is, where do we go for guidance? How do we discern which direction that we should go? Do we turn first to Jesus and bring decisions we're facing to him in prayer? Do we seek his counsel and search the scriptures? Do we look for answers elsewhere? Is Oprah our person of choice? Dr. Phil, where do we go? If the wonderful counselor lives right inside of us. We, have, we don't have to go anywhere. The question we have to answer for ourselves is, do we trust him in our day-to-day -day decisions, large and small? Do we believe him when he says, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always take what is meant for evil and turn it into good. Do we believe him? Do we trust him? When things seem to be spinning out of control, will I trust him? When things don't go as I would like them to, do I turn to my wonderful counselor? As I was thinking about this, there's, there's several, several um, implications, life outcomes you could call them, as I think about what it means to, to trust Jesus and Jesus alone as my wonderful counselor. I just want to share four with you real quickly. First, because Jesus is my wonderful counselor, I can trust him to listen to my problems and guide me in the right direction. I can trust him to listen to my problems and guide me in the right direction every single time. Whether I'm in pain and I'm being called on to stand up for him and endure that pain, or I'm prospering God is blessing me more than I can handle. I can trust him to hear and guide me in the right direction. Proverbs 3, 6, a passage many of you, I'm sure, know. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. 
in all you're doing, in everywhere you're going, in all your ways, consider him. Acknowledge him as Lord of your life, as wonderful counselor, and he will direct your paths. He will make your paths straight. Another life outcome is I can trust him with my worries. I can trust him with my concerns. Whatever's weighing heavy on your heart or your mind right now, First of all, realize you're not going through that. You don't have to go through this alone. Whatever you might be struggling with, and I know that at at the at Christmas time, many people struggle and hurt. Many people have relationships that are strained, and they wish you could be together. Many people have relationships that are strained, and you wish you wouldn't get together. to walk through that with you to show you what to do. We were um, just floored. Um, We have been praying about some things and and, uh, uh, we got a text from from someone who uh, I've been sharing some of this with and we've been praying together. And they said, we want you to know we got your back. We got your back. We're praying for you. If you're struggling, I, I don't want you to go through it alone. One of, the, one of the hardest things about Christmas is to come and sit in a crowd and be all alone. If you feel that way, please know that we are here for you. And it's easy for me to say, Jesus is here for you as well. But I would be betraying what it means to be a follower of Jesus if I said to you, be warm, be fed, Hey, Jesus is with you. If I didn't remind us all that we're in this together. It's like Benjamin Franklin once said. Gentlemen, we will either hang together or we will most certainly hang separately. We need each other. And we're here for each other only if we know that you have a need. In the pew in front of you, there's a contact card. You've got something you need some prayer for. Please take that contact card, and when the offering plate comes by, make sure you write that prayer request down. Put your contact information. If you want to talk to somebody about what's going on in your life, please fill the card out. We're here for you. But we can only be here for you if, if you let us know. Now, that's not true of our wonderful counselor. Who knows? But do you trust him with your worries? Do you trust him with your worries? Do not be anxious about anything, Paul says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The message version of James 1.5, a passage you may be familiar with, reads this way. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get, you'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believingly, without a second thought. I'm not sure if believingly is a word. But you get the sense. we're struggling with those worries and those concerns, it's because we are trusting ourselves. We are not trusting the wonderful counsel who resides in us. And we're not coming to someone else and saying, hey, I need some help. I need someone to pray with. I need someone to help me. We might even just need someone to say, just like the the father who brought his son to Jesus and he said, Jesus, if you can help him, I would be be very much appreciative. And Jesus said, if I can help him, he said, well, I believe. Help my unbelief. Anybody here like that? I raise both my hands. Do you trust him with your worries? A fourth outcome. Know that he loves me and my best interest and has my best interest at heart. He really loves you. And he's got your best interest at heart. 
this is a passage that I have been meditating on and thinking about for a little while. The, the, the picture is just incredible to me, and I hope that, that you will have this picture of God. But do me a little favor and close your eyes. I want you to imagine God doing what this passage says. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Imagine your father dancing and clapping and singing with you. Did you hear it? Is that the image of God you have? Maybe, maybe what would be helpful is to ruminate on that passage from Zephaniah. Rejoice over you with singing. Final, relax in his love. The love that is so wide, so deep beyond all understanding. John says, By this the love of God is revealed in us, that God has sent his one and only Son into the world so that we may live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Aren't you glad that God did not send us a card expressing his love and telling us to take care of it ourselves? He gave us, gave us everything we need to be successful in this life, whether we are rich or poor, sick or healthy, blue-collar or white-collar workers, whether we are have a graduate-level education or a bachelor's degree whether we have a high school diploma, a GED, or a simple tradesman, unskilled laborer, huh, or an undocumented guest, whether we're old, young, tall, short, skinny, fat, bald, doesn't matter. doesn't matter. His doer of miracles, of marvelous, wondrous things beyond human ability and understanding, who never, ever makes a bad call lives in us. He is my wonderful counselor. Let me say that with you. He is my wonderful counselor. Now, I, I want to hear it from the back. He is my wonderful counselor. If you have Jesus in your life, that is true of you. So what I want to challenge us all to do is listen to our wonderful counselor. Or turn the phrase a little differently. Listen to his wonderful counselor. Now, when I was a kid, one of the things that I looked forward to every single year was to write a letter to Santa. Anybody other, any, anyone else in here wrote a letter to Santa? Anyone still doing it? Okay. So, um, now, Santa is, is a... Uh, a historical figure who epitomized uh, the gift of giving and generosity. Um, so we, we, we honor, honor that, but really the true meaning of Christmas is obviously Jesus, right? So here's what I want to challenge us to do with that in mind. I want to ask you if you would consider writing a letter to Jesus. Remember the question we started with? Jesus, what do you want to renew in me today? What do you want to renew in me today? Start the letter by saying, by writing, Jesus, what do you want to renew in me today? As you've been listening to his voice, as we've prepared for communion, as we've gone through the whole service, as we'll do two more songs, let that question ruminate in you. Jesus, what do you want to renew in me? And whatever he says to you, I want to challenge you to surrender it to him in your life. And here's, here's where we're going to get real. I want you to take your time throughout this whole week and write this letter. I want you to put it in an envelope and seal it. I want you to put a stamp on it. I want you to address it to yourself. The next week, we're going to have a basket out in the foyer that you can put your letters in. I will collect them. Nobody will read them but you. And in 
six months, I'm going to mail them back to you. Jesus, what do you want through me and you today? Jesus, thank you so much that, that you look at us just like we are, and you do not cast us aside. You love us even in our brokenness, even with our under construction signs everywhere, dust and debris. And today you've, you've come to us and you've asked us to let you continue your new work, restoring us. Pray, God, that we would take that seriously, that we would ask ourselves the question, and that we would listen for your response.